Hello everybody and welcome back to another talk in this anatomy video series. I hope you've all enjoyed the video so far. Today we're going to have a look at the circle of Willis. We're going to start by looking at this 2D diagram that I'm sure you've all seen before. And then we're going to have a look at a time of flight MR angiogram where we can look at these vessels in 3D space. We'll see where the vessels course through the brain, which branches they give off and how they connect to form this circle of Willis. So start by having a look at this 2D image. And what this image is great for is identifying vessels and learning the name of vessels. What it's really terrible at is showing you the 3D relationship of these vessels in the brain. And that's why we're gonna have a look at the MRA. So let's start by having a look at the input to the posterior circulation. And that's these two vertebral arteries that will come up from the neck and join to form the basilar artery. Now our basilar artery will run anterior to the pons, up the clivus, and then bifurcate into our posterior cerebral arteries. Our vertebral arteries have a branch coming off here called our posterior inferior cerebellar artery, and then superior to that, either off the vertebrals or off the base of the basilar artery, will be our anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. As the basilar comes to an end, just before the basilar tip, we'll get a last branch coming off known as the superior cerebellar artery. We also have these arteries coming off the basilar, giving blood to our pons. Let's look at the anterior circulation. We have our internal carotid artery, which we've done a whole video on, I'll link it above, coming in to supply blood to the anterior circulation. We can see this ophthalmic artery coming off segment six. Then we enter segment seven, our posterior communicating artery is joining our anterior and posterior circulation. And then our internal carotid artery will bifurcate into our middle cerebral artery and our anterior cerebral artery. The circle is then completed by this anterior communicating artery, which will allow blood to flow between our two anterior cerebral arteries. So you may wonder why we formed this circle like this. It's not common in the body to have structures that link and form a circle like that. And the first it's, is it allows our brain to have normal pressures. There's no differential between our posterior and anterior circulation. Because there's free communication through here, the pressures will stay the same. And the second would be if we were to have a blockage of one of these vessels, we'd have an alternate route for blood to flow and supply perfusion to the brain. So it's kind of a built-in defense mechanism for us. So let's have a look at a 3D diagram. We can see here our MRA. It's been reconstructed into this 3D image. Here we have our vertebral arteries posteriorly coming up to join and form the basilar artery. Then that basilar then bifurcates into our posterior cerebral arteries going down towards the occipital lobe. The anterior circulation, we can see our internal carotid coursing up here before it bifurcates into our anterior cerebral and our middle cerebral arteries coming off into the uh, Sylvian fissure here. And then we can see a small anterior communicating artery there. If we look really closely on the patient's left hand side here, we can see a small posterior communicating artery on this side. It's a bit more difficult to see on that side, connecting our anterior and our posterior circulations. So let's have a look at our axial MRA. I'm going to scroll right down through the brain. We're going to get into the level of the neck. So here we can see our carotid, our internal carotid arteries, as well as our vertebral arteries coming up here. Now a good idea when looking at an MRA is to pick a side and then follow the anterior circulation all the way up, come back down, pick that same side and follow the posterior circulation up. And you can do that one by one through each of the vessels. What we're looking for here is any dilatation of the vessels that may suggest an aneurysm, any decreased blood flow, is there anything that's preventing blood from flowing through these vessels? And we want to look at, are these vessels perfusing the brain equally throughout? So we want to look at the caliber of those vessels. Are, is the caliber getting bigger? Is it stenosing getting smaller? And the only way we can do that is by looking at a single vessel all the way through. So let's start at our right internal carotid. Now we've got a whole video on this again, so I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, but we'll see this internal carotid coming into our carotid canal, giving our lacerial segment, segment C3 of the carotid, going through the cavernous sinus, up our, our clinoid, our ophthalmic sex segment, giving off our ophthalmic artery, up into our communicating segment, and then we should see our carotid bifurcating into our anterior cerebral artery. We can follow that all the way up into the brain here, 
as well as our middle cerebral artery coming through the sylvian fissure, as well as supplying blood to the vast majority of our cerebral cortex. And this is a good moment to look at the vessels on this side and compare it to the patient's left hand side and see if the signal intensity is the same as well as the distribution of those vessels. Is it the same on both sides? And we can just follow that through the brain itself. Now let's head back down and we're gonna quickly have a look at the left hand side. We can start on our left internal carotid artery coming up through the carotid canal, up diving forward through the cavernous sinus past the clinoid, the ophthalmic segment, the communicating segment, and bifurcating into our anterior cerebral and our middle cerebral arteries. Now let's have a look for our anterior communicating artery between the two anterior cerebral arteries. And if we look closely, we can see here our posterior communicating artery coming off the carotid, heading back there and joining our posterior cerebral arteries. Perfect. So let's head our way right back down to our vertebral arteries. Now again, that 2D image just had our vertebral arteries starting, and it's a good idea to remember where those vertebral arteries actually came from. So our vertebral arteries come off our subclavian arteries, our first segment of our subclavian arteries, make their way up the neck through the transverse foramina of the cervical spine before heading into the foramen magnum where we pick it up here. Now, one thing I want you to notice about the vertebral arteries, as I scroll up through the image, look how they become more and more anterior. You see that before they become the basilar, the vertebral arteries start posteriorly and head up anteriorly. And then the basilar itself heads up pretty straight in the brain. So this helps us when we're thinking about labeling the branches of the vertebral artery. Because if we think about our vertebral artery becoming more anterior as we head up, and it's supplying the cerebellum. You can see the cerebellum behind it here. So our lowest part of our inferior cerebellar arteries will be our posterior inferior cerebellar artery. As we head forward, we'll get our anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And then as we go up the basilar, we will see our superior cerebellar artery. So the, the start of this image is a bit poor quality, but we can just see our pica, our posterior inferior cerebellar arteries coming off. As we head more superiorly, either off the, the end of our vertebral arteries or the base of the basilar, we should see our anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Here we can see them coming off. There's the left one, there's the right one, supplying the inferior anterior portion of our cerebellum. As we then head up further, we should see our only superior cere cerebellar artery. So let's head up, 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 up. And we can see here our superior cerebellar artery coming in under the tent over that superior aspect of our cerebellum. As we head up further, we should then see the basilar bifurcate into our posterior cerebellar arteries. And we can see that here it bifurcates. We can see our interpeduncular space here, interpeduncular cistern. As we come up, they wrap around the midbrain and head towards the occipital lobe at the back here. And you can see them all here. That's our posterior circulation. We've gone through our anterior circulation and we can just faintly see our posterior communicating artery on this side and even more faint on the other side, our posterior communicating artery coming through there. Now, again, there's very few people that have a perfect circle of Willis shown like this. There's lots of variation amongst people and a large majority of that variation happens in this posterior communicating artery. We might have large caliber posterior communicating arteries and there might be quite inequality between those two. You have a big one on the right and a small one on the left. And as you go through more and more scans, you'll start to notice those more and more and to know that that is largely normal when you see differentials in size. Again, the importance here is to look at the caliber of those vessels to follow it up and see that signal intensity is maintained throughout the brain. So I hope that helps as a real whistle-stop tour through the circle of Willis. Most importantly, we need to follow each vessel at a time. If we don't look at each vessel, we're going to miss an aneurysm. We're going to miss an inclusion or a thrombus. Let me know what you want to hear. What anatomy do you really struggle with? I'm going to link a playlist here of our previous anatomy lectures. So go check those out if you haven't. Otherwise, I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.